Doug McKenzie and welcome to another episode of The Fintech Show. In this episode, we explore more about the digitization of trade finance. We learn about AI, blockchain and open banking. We sat down with thought leaders from SmartStream, OEKB and Bank of America Merrill Lynch to find out more about some of the pressing issues in the financial industry. I think one of the major challenges is that, uh, well, technology changes a lot. Uh, there is uh, different customer needs. The customers want to access uh, banking services differently. And I think there is a change in that direction. So it's one is IT systems. Uh, a second part is probably regulation with a regulation for banks being both a testing thing, not a threat, but a testing thing, which requires a lot of uh, attention. But it, it's also an opportunity. Uh, when you think of uh, fintechs or other suppliers of financial services entering the market, and if they enter the market, they have to uh, comply with the same rules. Business models of banks generally change. I think especially in the retail segment, uh, there, is a, there has been a lot of change. Customers approach banks differently. There is a lot more digitalization. Uh, there is a lot more uh, services that uh, customers can use themselves without coming to, to banking branches. And I think banks just have to get fit for the change. So I think it's a, a very interesting time in banking. It's uh, full with challenges, but also opportunities. So actually, you can say um, in the financial institutions, it's always about saving costs and cost efficiency. But these days, you also have regulatory requirements, which are quite difficult to meet for the banks and for big institutions. And you see now new startups that approach the fin financial industry completely different than before. So, for example, there are banks that approach it from a user perspective. They f first design the user interface and only afterwards they define how the back office works. So it's a complete different approach they do nowadays. And for a company like SmartStream, it means that we also have to do that innovation as well and talk to our customers and see what, where we can innovate and what we can change. I think one of the biggest challenges currently is the digitization era, uh, how to manage the continually evolving customer requirements and the pace of technology change, but at the same time doing what banks are required to do, managing liquidity, risk, compliance, anti-money laundering, etc. And that's becoming increasingly challenging with the fast-paced world. So how has digitization specifically changed the way that GTS operates? Well, first of all, um, you have changing client requirements. Clients' expectations are evolving more quickly than they used to. You've got a distinction, of course, between what consumers are looking for, which is more around ease of access, experience, mobility, versus large corporates and businesses who are looking more for predictability, managing by exception, risk management. So within this digitization journey, you've got different client segments looking for different things. And of course, at the other extreme, uh, you have organizations that uh, are still using using a lot of the more traditional ways of banking. So one of the challenges is managing that client experience depending on where they are on that digitization journey, which is not always the same place. Next up, we spoke with Bank of America Merrill Lynch about how digitizing trade finance is dramatically helping that industry. We also spoke with Andreas Berner from SmartStream to find out more about what they've been doing in the blockchain space. I think it's fair to say that trade finance is one of the last areas of our industry that hasn't benefited yet fully from digitization. So there's a huge opportunity uh, to bring trade finance into line with some of the more automated parts of, of the banking sector. It's important to look at where we are today and then what potential could come in the future. If you look at trade finance today, it's already very well digitized when you compare it with 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, most clients are now using online channels, Technology that's not new, for example, optical character recognition, which has been around for many years, has been really well refined to the point where error rates are now very low. 
Um, banks are already uh, integrating things like artificial intelligence and robotics for some of those lower end processing tasks. So it's not fair to say that trade finance today is not yet digitized at all. But there's still a lot of potential clearly. And when you look to the future, it's extremely powerful. Um, payments are very automated already. And one of the main drivers for that is there's generally a very small number of parties involved in a payment. So it's easier to drive standardization and schemes that digitize the end-to-end -end payment flow. Of course, in trade finance, you have many more players, not just the banks and the importers and the exporters, but you also have government, shipping companies, customs authorities, tax authorities. And trade finance is really at the mercy of the least sophisticated actor within that end-to-end -end payment chain. So there's a huge opportunity to, to drive automation, and automation that will ultimately lead to increased economic activity and, and efficiency, which is really what the, the, the benefit will be. There's a lot of talk about the impact of distributed ledger technology on trade. That's a huge opportunity. It's just one of the many things that I think will, will play into digitizing the end-to-end -end value chain. The important thing, though, is it's pointless, in my view, to digitize trade finance. You have to digitize trade. And by that, I mean the whole end-to-end -end process from the point where somebody decides that they are going to purchase something right through to when uh, the, the goods are received, the invoice is issued, payment is received, and effectively the item is, is closed off as an accounts receivables item. Uh, and until you get to that point, the end-to-end -end value chain will not be fully digitized and we won't be able to reap the full rewards. Yeah, where do you see the future of trade finance going? I think the future of trade finance will still be a lot financed by banks. So I think the trade finance will, will be there. It might be that some parts, some means of, uh, of doing trade finance uh, will change. It's, there might be a change in technology. There is a lot of talk of using the blockchain technology for trade, uh, for processing trades and uh, for trade finance as well. Uh, so we'll see how that develops. But I think it's, uh, it's not going to make banks redundant in the whole process. It's just that the means of uh, doing it will probably change a little bit. But there will be a need for trade finance also in the future. So blockchain's been touted as the miracle cure for everything in the financial services industry for the last nine years. It, what has it actually achieved? The interesting thing about blockchain is that when it was, when it was published in 2008, 2009, everybody thought of it being just a cryptocurrency. And only some years later, people found out that there's more to it. There can be rules applied, so we were talking about smart contracts. Then they found out uh, that it's not just about the end customer, and, and it's also about applying it to B2B customers. And that's, that's very much the area where we are in, right? Uh, so um, the interesting thing about blockchain is that it's it's a perfect new technology. We haven't had that. It's perfectly safe. So you can say for 10 years now, it hasn't been hacked, although there's so much money on the blockchain. And because of these smart contracts, it can be applied whenever there's a workflow in place. And you can simplify workflows that are distributed over companies, within companies, and so on. So you can see that there are so many applications like trade finance and corporate actions and so they are switching to this, this new technology and they are big cost saver and that is also where we, where we look into that market and work with our clients together to, to solve some of that problems. So can you tell me what is SmartStream actually working on in the blockchain space? So last year we did a POC uh, with uh, Ripple, together with Ripple to use our products with blockchain messaging and we succeeded. So, so now we have software products that are blockchain ready. Yeah? But that's being a message gateway, but there's more to it, like I said before. So, so um, interesting is that our product range is, has a lot to do with workflows, with uh, corporates working to, together with uh, decentralized storage, and all that points to using blockchain technology. So at the moment, we are looking very much into our products and how we can use blockchain 
there are some POCs with, uh, with our clients currently uh, ongoing. And I think we, we will see, see soon some of our, our POCs. Yeah? We went on to find out more about AI and what it's going to mean for the financial services industry and how some of the companies have had trouble implementing it. So in the financial industry, you can say we have a lot of workflows. There's a lot of manual uh, things needed. So many things require large amounts of staff to, to do that. And that is a typical application for AI. So whenever you do things very similar, but not the same way uh, every time, uh, when you have massive amounts of data that we have in the financial industry, uh, whenever you have so many sources of data, then, then it's a perfect application for AI. What are some of the difficulties when applying AI, especially for the financial institutions? Well, that's an interesting question because AI can be applied in so many fields and uh, the new machine learning technology comes from mostly picture recognition and they have somehow a different problem than we have in the financial industry. So in the financial industry, it's a lot about interpretation of AI. Uh, we cannot use algorithms that would not explain why a certain decision was taken. For example, if somebody is applying for a loan, uh, you would fill in your salary, whether you're married, your children and so on. And when that decision is then taken by a machine learning algorithm and he didn't get the loan because of a, some criteria, he might ask, what was the reason for that? And if a bank asks, answers just, it was our machine learning black box, that's not enough, right? So, so you can see that there are like two groups in the machine learning community. There's the one group that tries to in, just use technologies that are interpretable, so you can see why a certain reason was, a certain decision was taken. And the other things are applying these deep learning uh, things, which are just great. It's, it's like a black box. You cannot say why a decision was derived from the algorithm. So it's a craft in machine learning to decide which algorithm you may apply to what problem. And it's also about ethics. Yeah? You, you really have to see that in the financial industry, it's about people, it's about their money. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive subject and that has to be taken into account. Can you tell me how SmartStream can really help lower cost per transaction, increase compliance and generally improve the security for the financial institutions involved? So when we apply AI, uh, you see that when you look at the manual processes, they can be supported by machine learning. So either you see that people do the similar work from day to day, so we can use machine learning to support their work, but we can also do that to do a quality process. So when somebody is tired, we will find when he makes uh, mistakes during his work. When we apply AI, it's always about uh, analytics. We look into big uh, data feeds and try to find out connections between data that you cannot easily find as a, find as a human being. We are looking for repeating tasks. So whenever humans do similar things from day to day, then we think they can be easily supported. And we want to increase also the user experience. So when, when users do, do use our applications in a way that we can support them more, we show um, like selection criteria before they select something or so. That's also a big field for AI that, that is nice uh, to, to apply it on. Yeah. Finally, Ad van der Poel from Bank of America Merrill Lynch detailed and broke down how regulation is going to adapt to open banking in the future. Well, open banking has really come about since uh, the introduction of the new payment service directive, the PSD2, so piece of regulation in, in, uh, in the EU. And uh, that kind of forces the banks to open up their, let's say, bank infrastructure to their clients accessing that same infrastructure through, through a third party whether that be a fintech or any other type of party. 
And that is why it's called open banking, because the bank's opening themselves up. And although the payment service directive and open banking, it has a large focus on consumer side of the business, we actually think um, it'll be usually beneficial on the corporate side as well. And that's why we at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, where outside of the US we do not service uh, consumers, but we do service uh, uh, corporates and institutions, we are very focused on uh, this open banking piece, which uses the technology of APIs to connect these third-party platforms to the banks on behalf of both our clients. And so we see our corporates using uh, these APIs in their treasury management systems, in their ERP systems, and it may not be that mature right now. Again, the focus is primarily initially on the retail side and on consumers. But over the years to come, we think that's where uh, a lot of development will be, and that's actually where the main advantages of open banking sit. On the other hand, if you think about the consumer side, uh, we actually think how that open banking evolves will be, uh, in a few years' time, it will look very different from what people perceive it to be today. You have to think about much more where payments will be more embedded in the context of the transaction. So a consumer, uh, well, actually, we're all used to it today uh, uh, on our mobile phones where with, you make the payment win, within the app. Uh, and actually, uh, you stay within the app to do the payment. You don't leave the app to go somewhere else to do the payment. And that, that's what I call embedded payments. And that embedded element will, will get more and more into our daily lives, no longer just in the apps, uh, but in other areas as well. Very well, for example, in your car. And so that embedded element is the way for the consumer side to go, which is very different from uh, how people look at it today. So can you tell me, what does PSD2 and open banking going to mean for OEKB in the future? Uh, as OEKB is not a retail bank and we do not do any payment services, it's probably not going to affect us as a specialist bank uh, ourselves. But I think it's, uh, it's the thought that's behind it, the open banking with uh, providing a platform where you can uh, access banking services from several providers this could be a path for the future, not only for retail business, but, but, but also for corporate business. And platform business in general is uh, the thing that's going to probably dominate the future. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us on the next FinTech Show.